Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. My name is Dennis Shea. I am the executive director of BPC's new J. Ronald Twilliger Center for Housing Policy. We are very grateful uh, today to have this opportunity to discuss HUD's newly released Worst Case Housing Needs Report. HUD has reported on worst case housing needs since the mid 1980s, providing an authoritative look at the critical problems facing low income renter households. The Terwilliger Center was founded on the idea that every American, regardless of wealth or background, should have the opportunity to live in a decent, affordable and safe home. Working towards that goal requires a rigorous understanding of the housing challenges facing America's low income households, as well as an appreciation for the national and regional trends in housing. The worst case housing needs report is a critical tool that helps shed light on these issues. And as a former assistant secretary for the office within HUD charged with producing uh, this report for Congress, I know the blood, sweat and tears involved in analyzing and summarizing the data that informs the report. So I want to thank the HUD team and particularly those in the Office of Policy Development and Research for all their hard work. One quick note before we begin, we invite all attendees to submit questions using the live chat on YouTube or Facebook or on Twitter using hashtag BPC Live. The BPC team will be monitoring these throughout today's webinar and sharing them with the speakers. Let me now introduce our first speaker, uh, Peggy Bailey. Peggy is the Senior Advisor on Rental Assistance at HUD, where she works to enhance the department's rental subsidy and supply programs, which help millions of families afford housing. Peggy has a long record as an advocate for low-income Americans, previously serving as Vice President for Housing Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Peggy, we really appreciate you uh, joining us today, along with all your HUD colleagues. We know you are incredibly busy. So thank you for taking time uh, for this important discussion. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Peggy. Thanks, Dennis. And thank you to the entire team at the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting today's event and highlighting HUD's latest worst case needs, worst case housing needs report to Congress. I also want to give as a special word of appreciation to the HUD team, as, as, as Dennis noted, especially the Office of Policy Development and Research, and particularly Jennifer Turnham, who you'll hear from in a, um, in a minute. There is rarely something that comes from HUD that PDNR does not touch. And given everything that's going on right now, Jennifer and the team delivered this excellent report that many rely on to understand housing affordability or un unfortunately, unaffordability. This year in particular, we need this to inform policy and couldn't be more proud of the team's work. Throughout the pandemic, housing has gotten a lot of attention. Concerns about an increase in evictions and foreclosures, the recent increase in housing costs, and the need to address housing related costs such as utilities, broadband, and quality safety concerns have all risen to the spotlight. What our worst case housing needs report shows is that, is that these issues are not new. People were struggling to afford a home before the pandemic, and even a strong economy with low unemployment didn't fix it. Actually, it continued to get a little worse. And who is hit hardest? People with low incomes and people of color. This is why it is so important to tease out demographic data. And while the economy was strong, it shows that, that that doesn't mean that it was equally strong for everyone. The result is that more and more households are spending bigger chunks of their paychecks on, uh, on rent and leaving less for other basic needs like food, transportation, and healthcare. We don't know what the next worst case housing needs report will show, but if passed as prologue, it will be the same if not worse, largely due to the economic fallout from the pandemic for so many low and middle income people. So how do we fix this? And what are the tools we should be employing or creating today, particularly with the additional relief resources out in communities to re reverse 
the housing affordability crisis. That's what I'm excited about for today's panel to discuss and many other important questions. So first though, it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Turnham to give an overview of the worst case housing needs report. Jennifer is the director of the policy development division of HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research. The policy development division's mission is to ensure the relevance of research to policy, to advise the department on the policy implications of research and to serve as a key HUD resource for data and, and analysis. It also produces this biannual worst case needs housing, worst case housing needs report. Prior to joining HUD in 2020, Jennifer spent nearly two decades at APT Associates where she led numerous research studies on diverse housing and community development topics. Jennifer, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to provide an overview of the Worst Case Housing Needs 2021 report to Congress. Can we bring up, thank you. The 2021 report is the 18th, as, as, as Dennis mentioned, the 18th in a multi-decade series documenting and analyzing critical housing problems facing very low-income renter families. Over the years, the report has documented scarcity in affordable housing and the role of housing assistance and housing supply in addressing that scarcity. The authors of this, year, this year's report are Theria Alvarez and Barry Steffen, who work with me in the Policy Development Division at HUD. And I'd like to take a moment to express my appreciation for the hard work they put into this report as well as for Barry's many years working on HUD's worst case housing needs reports. The 2021 report and all previous worst case housing needs reports can be found at huduser.org. <clears throat> the worst case needs report analyzes data from the American Housing Survey or AHS. The AHS is sponsored by HUD and conducted by the Census Bureau. And it's been collected since 1973 and every two years since 1984. The AHS is a housing unit based survey that provides data on the physical conditions of homes and neighborhoods, the costs of financing and maintaining homes, and the characteristics of the people who live in the homes. The AHS data are typically ready for release nine to 12 months after the survey field work is complete, and HUD then requires some additional time to analyze the results. So the 2021 worst case needs report is based on 2019 AHS data. This is a key contextual factor because the data for the report were collected before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what does it mean to have a worst case housing need? Worst case needs households are renter households who don't receive housing assistance, who have incomes at or below 50% of the area median income, and who are either paying more than 50% of their household income on rent, are living in severely inadequate housing, or are experiencing both of these problems. In 2019, as in previous years, 95% of households with worst case needs had worst case needs only because they had severe rent burden, meaning they were paying more than one half of their income for rent. One thing to note is that people experiencing homelessness are not included in the counts of worst case needs households. People experiencing homelessness clearly have great need for housing, but they're not counted in the American Housing Survey because the AHS covers only housing units and the households that live in them. The slide shows the trend in the number of households with worst case needs over the past 20 years. In 2019, 7.77 million renter households experienced worst case housing needs. Worst case needs increased by 50,000 households between 2017 and 2019, which is a statistically insignificant increase. Worst case needs have generally declined since 2011, when they peaked at 8.48 million households. Uh, however, there are still about 2 million more households with worst case needs in 2019 than in the early 2000s when there was more affordable housing available. Of the 7.7 million households 
7.77 million households with worst case needs, about three quarters are extremely low income, meaning they have incomes at or below 30% of the area median income. Before I go on, I'd like to note that the charts I'm presenting today have been reformatted and in some cases modified for this presentation, but they all derive from charts and tables in the 2021 report. So at the bottom of each slide, you'll see a little note in blue identifying the relevant exhibit in the report. This exhibit shows the results of our analysis of the relative influence of the factors driving change in worst case needs between 2017 and 2019. Starting from the left-hand side, we see an increase in worst case needs of 159,000 households attributable to new household formation, the results of population growth. Shifts in tenure toward home ownership over the two-year period reduced worst case needs by about 45,000 households because the growth in renter households lagged the growth in homeowner households. In the third column, you can see that changes in renter household income increased worst case needs by about 20,000 because there was a net increase of very low income renters. Worst case needs also increased by an estimated 135,000 because housing assistance became scarcer relative to the expanding number of very low income renters. So in other words, the rental assistance gap widened. Now counteracting all of these factors pushing worst case needs up was a modest expansion in the rental housing supply over this period, which reduced the competition for affordable units. The increase in rental housing reduced worst case needs by 218,000, which in turn reduced the net increase in worst case needs to just 50,000. So this slide shows the number of households with worst case needs in 2019 across different racial and ethnic groups. About 3.6 million of the 7.77 million households with worst case needs were non-Hispanic white households. About 1.9 million were Hispanic households, followed by 1.6 million non-Hispanic black households and 420,000 non-Hispanic Asian households. Other races and ethnicities totaled about 210,000 households. On this slide, the blue bars show the, the share of very low income renter households within each racial and ethnic group that experienced worst case needs in 2019. The orange bars show the share of all households within each group that experienced worst case needs in 2019. So you can see from the chart that the rate at which households experienced worst case needs varied by race and ethnicity. Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander households had the highest rates of worst case needs at 55% of very low income renters and 13% of all households. Next highest were Asian households and Hispanic households. Black non-Hispanic households had a relatively low rate of worst case needs among very low income renters at 36%. This reflects the relatively high rate of housing assistance among very low income black renters. However, if you look at the orange bar, you'll see that the rate of worst case needs among all black households was 10%, more than twice that for white households. And this reflects the fact that a much higher share of black households compared to white households are very low income and rent their housing rather than own. This chart illustrates the vital role that housing assistance plays in preventing households from experiencing worst case needs. In the exhibit, central cities are shown by blue bubbles, suburbs by purple bubbles, and non-metro areas by green bubbles. Larger bubbles represent a larger national share of worst case needs households. Across regions and metro locations, housing assistance is inversely correlated with worst case needs. So you'll see that locations in the upper left quadrant of the chart, such as non-metro areas in the Midwest and the Northeast, have higher than average levels of housing assistance and lower than average levels of worst case needs. And by contrast, places in the lower right quadrant, such as central cities in the West and suburban areas in the South, have lower rates of housing assistance, leading to higher rates of worst case needs. So we noted earlier that 95% of households with worst case needs in 2019 
had worse case needs only because they had severe rent burden. Given that worst case needs are largely an affordability problem, access to affordable units or to rental subsidies is critical to addressing the problem. Over the past 20 years, the unmet need for decent, safe, and affordable housing has continued to outpace both income growth and the ability of government to supply housing assistance and facilitate affordable housing production. So this results in a housing supply mismatch, which is especially severe for extremely low-income renters. And the essential shortage is exacerbated because higher income households occupy many of the units that otherwise would be available to extremely low income renters. So on the chart, the orange line shows the number of housing units that are available and affordable for every 100 very low income renter households. And the blue line shows the number of housing units affordable and available for every 100 extremely low income renter households. In 2019, there were only 62 units affordable and available per 100 very low income renters. The supply of housing was even more constrained for extremely low income renters with only 40 units available for every 100 households. Extremely low income renters did not benefit much from the modest growth in rental housing supply that took place between 2017 and 2019. So this year's worst case needs report contains a special addendum on the potential effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on worst case needs. And you'll recall that the data in the report are from 2019, so were collected prior to the pandemic. As we all know, the pandemic caused an economic recession and major negative shock to many households' incomes. At the same time, the federal policy response involves significant household subsidies and eviction moratoria intended to mitigate the most negative effects. So it's not clear how the pandemic might affect worst case needs as documented in the 2021 AHS. Note that the 2021 AHS data collection took place this past spring and summer and is now wrapping up. So the addendum to the report discusses the major federal relief laws that could have affected household income and rent payments this year such as the CARES Act, the COVID-19 relief bill, and the American Rescue Plan. The addendum also analyzes data on rental payments and risk of evict evictions collected during the pandemic through the Census's Household Pulse Survey. And then the addendum concludes with an exercise where we try to estimate the effect of federal relief on worst case needs um, for, a typical, for a hypothetical household, and I'll turn to that now. So I know this slide is incredibly complicated and dense, um, but I encourage you to review the full table in the report at your leisure. The idea behind the table is to try to synthesize and think about the numerous factors that might affect the level and measurement of worst case needs. This table examines the pandemic's impact for a hypothetical family of four that includes two minimum wage workers who lost their jobs during the pandemic. And it considers how the AHS might treat their needs. So the American Housing Survey, like other major surveys, generally counts pre-tax money income. It doesn't count post-tax income, non-recurring income, or benefits such as food assistance. The values shown in brackets represent the income sources that are not captured by the AHS. The first numeric column of the table presents data for the family absent the pandemic while the second column presents the case where the family loses its employment due to the pandemic, but also receives federal pandemic benefits. The enhanced unemployment insurance benefits have the potential to leave our hypothetical family financially better off in terms of pre-tax income, though its post-tax income would not change a great deal. With pandemic assistance, the household's estimated housing cost burden as measured by the AHS would fall below the 50% threshold that triggers a worst case need. So this family would no longer count as having worst case needs because the unemployment benefits the family received exceeded their pre-tax incomes as minimum wage workers. On an after-tax basis, however, the family's housing cost burden would not change much between the two scenarios and would continue to qualify as a moderate housing cost burden. So this analysis is by no means definitive, and of course it contains a lot of assumptions, but it does illustrate how it can be complicated to predict how the pandemic and the federal response will affect worst case needs, both 
as experienced by households and also as captured in the American Housing Survey. What is clear from our 2021 worst case needs report, as, as Peggy mentioned, is that even before the pandemic hit in 2019, this country had a large and persistent housing affordability problem that disproportionately affected the lowest income households and households of color. Reducing worst case needs requires both demand side and supply side solutions, such as increasing the incomes of very low income renters, expanding rental assistance, preserving the, existed, the existing assisted housing, uh, is it, ugh, the existing assisted and affordable housing stock and reducing barriers to the production of new affordable housing. So we really appreciate your interest in this year's worst case housing needs report. And I'm greatly looking forward to the panel discussion. So with that, I'll introduce Ben Winter who will moderate the discussion. Ben Winter rejoined HUD earlier this year as Deputy Assistant Secretary, the Office of Policy Development in HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research. Ben oversees the Office of Policy's work in assessing the policy relevance of HUD research, in analyzing legislative proposals and initiatives, in disseminating policy and research findings, and in managing HUD's international and philanthropic engagements. Immediately before coming to HUD, Ben led the California Community Foundation's Housing and Economic Opportunity Initiatives in Los Angeles, and he was the Chief Housing Officer for the City of Los Angeles. And in these roles, Ben worked on helping to strengthen low-income communities, to address homelessness, and to grow the region's affordable housing supply. So over to you, Ben. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer, so much for that presentation. Um, also, thank you for your leadership in policy development and research. It is a joy and a pleasure to work with you every day. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to the staff. I know we've said that before, to the staff who've been working on this report, um, Theria and Barry. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of, of what you're able to pull off um, and I'm, uh, really uh, love working with you all. Um, and, you know, uh, thank you all for joining the panel discussion. I'm really excited to introduce all of our panelists and start a little uh, chat with them. Here they are on the screen. Uh, we've got Chris Herbert joining us, uh, who's the managing director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, he's also a lecturer at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. We're super lucky to have him here because he leads the team that uh, writes the nation's uh, the State of the Nation's Housing Report and the Biannual uh, America Rental Housing Report. Those are two key resources for understanding housing markets in this country. So really excited to get his, uh, his thoughts uh, in the panel. We also have Robin Hughes zooming in from Los Angeles, California. Hello, Robin. Uh, Hi. She is the President and Executive Director of uh, Abode Communities. That is a prolific affordable housing developer in California. And Robin has been involved in housing community development issues for more than 30 years now. Um, and we're really excited to hear her bring a local and uh, state and affordable housing developer perspective to the panel. We also have Dennis Shea, uh, who uh, you've already heard from today uh, from the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's the executive director of DPC's brand new uh, Center for Housing Policy. And I'm really excited to have Dennis on this panel to share his expertise because out of all of us, he's probably had the most history with it, having overseen the office uh, that produces it during the Bush years. So welcome, Dennis. And finally, last but not least, we have Ann Oliva. Uh, Ann is the Vice President for Housing Policy at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, like Dennis, Ann is uh, also another HUD alum. I'm also a HUD alum as well. Uh, and uh, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs, um, uh, an office that really focuses in on the, the lowest income uh, band that we're going to be discussing today on the panel. Um, and she's also spent time as a Senior Advisor at the Corporation for Supportive Housing. So thank you, Anne, so much for joining us today. Um, so uh, to get us started, I wanted to just kind of uh, take a step back and reflect a little bit about why this report matters. Why do we keep doing it? Um, and I'm gonna offer you, Dennis, to give us your, your insights first since you spent the most time on this report. 
Uh, why do you think we should be producing this every two years and investing in the underlying American housing survey that helps us glean all these um, uh, data points in the report? Well, thank you, Ben. And uh, I do want to tip my hat to Theria and Barry Stefan uh, as well. Uh, Barry, I know I worked with Barry back in the day when I was at uh, PDNR. But to answer your question, let me just start by telling you about the, the new center. I mean, our mission is to promote bipartisan policies that advance housing affordability for all. And you cannot really do this unless you understand uh, the housing needs of the lowest income Americans, as well as the trends in housing, both on a national and a regional level. And the data provided by the American Housing Survey, as interpreted by HUD in the worst case housing needs report, is critical to this understanding. Uh, Ron Twilliger reminds us that uh, the housing affordability challenge has two dimensions. You have the supply side dimension and the demand side dimension. Now, what we learned from the worst case housing needs report is that there's a severe shortage of affordable rental homes. We heard Jennifer's presentation. There are only 62 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 very low income renters. And there's just 40 available and affordable rental homes for every extreme for every 100 extremely low income renters. So there's a severe shortage of affordable rental homes, which we need to address as a nation. On the demand side, what do we learn from the worst case housing needs report? We learned that a little more than 5 million rental renter households receive federal housing assistance, but there are 7.77 million uh, renter households who are very low income who have worst case housing needs, meaning they pay in excess of 50% of their income just on housing costs. And that you know, produces incredibly difficult trade-offs between paying the monthly rent and buying healthcare, paying for food, supporting your kids' education. So the data I'm saying provided by the American Housing Survey and interpreted by the, the, the worst case needs report and HUD is, in, is incredible. Now, uh, Jennifer mentioned a little bit about the American Housing Survey. This was created and uh, launched in 1973. It's done every two years. It's a biennial assessment of uh, housing units uh, throughout the United States and the people who live in those housing units. What are their characteristics? Before that existed, before we had the American Housing Survey, to learn about the housing situation in the United States, we primarily relied on the decennial census. And that occurs, of course, every 10 years. And that obviously is unsatisfactory if you're trying to get a real something close to a semblance of a real-time um, understanding of what's going on in housing in the nation. So I, I hope Congress continues to support uh, the American Housing Survey. I hope it continues. It directed HUD uh, to create the worst case housing needs report and report to Congress. This is a report to Congress. I hope it continues to uh, insist that HUD uh, do this. And I just wanted these are very, two very valuable documents for anyone working in the field and wants to, to uh, understand and appreciate what's going on in, in housing. Thank you, Dennis. And what about you? You're zooming in from another uh, housing policy think tank uh, organization. Um, what, from your perspective, uh, what is the value of this report and why should we be continuing to track worst case housing needs as a nation? Yeah, thank you, Ben. And I wanna just start by saying thank you so much for having me today and for giving me the opportunity to talk about this report and answer the question of why it's so important. And I'm gonna take two different routes here, so bear with me for a minute. From, from starting with the analytical side, right, at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which is where I am now, we consider this data incredibly valuable. We cite this report um, and the numbers that it provides. I can't tell you how many slide decks I have that have data from this, uh, from this report included as an indicator of housing needs sort of generally across the country and who is most impacted uh, by worst case housing. On the 
AHS side, we really, we use that data. It is all the time. It is incredibly important to our advocacy and our estimates around uh, that only one out of every four eligible households uh, for housing choice vouchers actually get one uh, is related to that particular data. So it is incredibly important to us from an analytical point of view. But I'm just going to go down another road for, for just a second. I've had the privilege of working both at the national and federal levels, as well as at the local level over the last few years. And I can tell you and I can tell our audience that this data forms the basis of key policy, resource allocation, and program design uh, decisions and informs discussions across the affordable housing spectrum, all the way from homelessness assistance to affordable housing development and rental assistance. And let me just give you a real example of how this might play out. Jennifer mentioned a, a, a moment ago that people experiencing homelessness are not actually included in this report. That comes through the annual homeless assessment report uh, to Congress because they're not actually renters. But this data actually provides really important information to cities and counties and states across the country when they're thinking about their homelessness assistance um, resources. So as you know, there have been, uh, there's been an increase in unsheltered homelessness across the country for five, I would guess, uh, when we see the next AHAR, it'll be six straight years. We're seeing a rise in the number of encampments, especially on the West Coast, but also in lots of places across the country. So uh, I know a couple of you sit on the West Coast, so uh, let's put, put a note in, in the fact that we're seeing that on the West Coast. We also know that the solution to homelessness is safe and affordable housing with community supports. Um, but at the local level, what often happens is that conversations, as folks get frustrated with seeing um, increased encampments and more unsheltered homelessness in particular, those conversations can start to blame individuals for some sort of perceived shortcomings rather than really understanding homelessness as and housing instability as systemic issues that need system level equity based solutions. So these data that we're talking about today help to tell the story of all of how all of these things connect both nationally and at the local level. And what I was really struck by when I was reading this report this year is the difference really between extremely low income households and households in other income brackets and how uh, ELI households account for 74% of the worst case um, housing needs cases. And that's something that we haven't seen since 2005. So we need all of this data to understand that dynamic uh, and how to allocate resources, build policy, and design programs to the reality of what, of what we're seeing, both on the housing instability side and on the homelessness side. And I'll note earlier, I said something about uh, increases in encampments and unsheltered homelessness on the West Coast. In this report, you'll see an increase in uh, worst case housing needs uh, in the West of almost 7%. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. So really what I'm, what I'm, all of that is to say that this data tells the story of how all of these factors are connected and really drives home why we need to work together across systems using an equity-based approach to address all of those needs. Thank you, Anne. It's really good insights. And, you know, you alluded to how this report can play into local conversations, right? And so Robin, I, I wanna to turn to you and see if you ha would like to reflect a little bit about why is it important for us to focus on worst case housing needs, especially uh, from the local context. Thank you, Ben. And thank you uh, for having me here today. This is a critically important topic, especially as uh, Anne has noted that we're continuously to 
increasing homelessness as well as housing instability along oh, among low income and extremely low income uh, households. So, um, so I'm going to pick up on what Anne was talking about earlier. So as a practitioner in the field, I can think about and talk about what um, I see on a project level, individual level, portfolio level at both communities. Um, but what this data does is help us tell our story and sometimes even define our story, which is really great. So it helps us uh, in local advocacy. And Anne touched on this in terms of taking this data and taking what we know from our own experience when we lease up an affordable housing development, we experience that supply and demand that Dan has talked about earlier when we are uh, receiving, you know, five times the number of uh, applications as we have available units. It clearly demonstrates this need for uh, more affordable housing. But when we're able to point back to this data and say, that's not unique to this one experience or opportunity, that's the data for Los Angeles, for the region, or for California, for the state, whatever that might be. Um, when we um, think about who we serve as an affordable housing developer, again, we can take um, our intuitive information that we get here in Los Angeles, um, but, but we know if there is an extreme need for housing for extremely low and low income people, that's where we want to target our mission and our resources for producing that housing. Um, and what this report does is sort of shine light on where policy and program alternatives should be. It's very clear that the market is not going to produce housing for extremely low and low income uh, households. So there has to be government intervention in that. So we can point to this data to say our local resources should be targeted towards uh, and I'll say in Los Angeles, both sides, the homelessness uh, situation that we have here now, as well as extremely low income housing, uh, so that we don't have more and more people slipping into, um, into homelessness. So it, again, it helps to define our story, helps to determine where policy and program direction should go. Um, you know, one of the things that I find that's interesting that's not in the report as well, and we see this in Los Angeles all the time, is the way in which extremely low and low income renters compensate for the high cost of housing is by overcrowding. And we often see, you know, a family of four living in a one bedroom apartment or um, multiple households or multiple generations renting a two bedroom apartment and one family sleeping in each room plus the living room, or the other extreme where you have a garage that's been converted into, you know, four, four uh, units for folks. So, um, you know, that's another way of sort of measuring the, uh, the impact that high cost rental areas like Los Angeles uh, and how we are addressing the, the, the housing choices and needs of extremely low income people are impacted. So it'd be great if the report also looked into that a tad bit. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, Chris Herbert, want to give you give you the mic here. You've uh, spent your a lot of time on different affordability metrics and uh, reports examining need across the country. Um, what is what makes this report different? What's the value add for this report for the research community? Um, how does it fit into the broader uh, research world from your perspective? Uh, yes, I'm uh, happy to answer that. And just I uh, want to say how much the, the Joint Center for Housing Studies anticipates and waits for this report to come out each year because it is so valuable. Um, you know, there are three things I'd point to, Ben. One is that to start with, it's um, it measures household incomes in terms of AMI, American Area Median Income, in categories that map to policy. So overall, the report in general, I would say, is is very strongly policy relevant, and it starts with this. Uh, categorizing households by that measure, which doesn't seem like it's that complicated, but when you think about people's, the, the, the measures differ by household size, by where you live in the country, that, that's a really valuable uh, building block for the analysis. The, the second thing that's really unusual is because of the fact that it's using the American Housing Survey, it's able to take into account who is actually receiving housing assistance. Um, and so when we look at who's experiencing worst case needs, it factors out the fact that some people are getting the benefit of 
uh, you know, a voucher or project-based subsidy or public housing. And so we're uh, unlike the American Community Survey where that information doesn't exist, we can take into account whether or not uh, what what how people are being able to access those that assistance and to what extent is that helping to meet the need for uh, affordable decent housing and then lastly the measures of housing quality and we don't talk very much about housing quality uh, these days because it has become much less of an issue than it was 50 years ago but for families who are in severely inadequate housing and this is housing that lacks complete plumbing uh, that may have uh, a lack of electricity or have exposed wiring. It, is, it has holes of, of more than a foot in the walls or the floors. So when we're talking about severely inadequate, we are talking about housing that is uh, really challenging to inhabit. And so it's a problem that I think that's uh, um, overlooked. And the fact that this report makes takes advantage of that uh, information that really is only available in the American Housing Survey to put that all together. It paints a portrait of the, the nation's need for housing assistance um, that is really second to none. Okay, thanks, Chris. So it sounds like I'm hearing consensus that uh, this report is valuable enough that we should continue to do it every two years. I agree, uh, and I would think uh, so does the Congress. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the actual findings and, and what you're taking away from, from the findings this year. Um, for me, the, the biggest takeaway are you know, the prevalence of worst case housing needs hasn't really budged in recent years, um, especially for extremely low income renters. Uh, and that the three major factors that are kind of driving that are, we've got a shortage of rental assistance, a weak growth in the supply of housing that creates more uh, competition uh, for renters, and that we've got pretty slow income growth, especially at the lower income bands. Those are kind of the three takeaways, but you know, a lot has changed since 2019 uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and Chris, uh, I wanna kind of follow along with you. I know you've kind of been putting out some new research on uh, the impacts of the pandemic. Do you think these are the three factors are still kind of the driving factors between worst case housing needs? What, what else is happening by the pandemic that you might think are affecting worst case needs? Yeah, you know, I think the pandemic in many respects has exacerbated the drivers. And so by certainly by undermining people's ability to make a living, uh, you know, lowering incomes, that's affected uh, worst case needs. Um, it's also um, initially uh, rents were falling during the first phase of the pandemic. Uh, and kind of oddly, we had uh, housing prices going up and rents falling, but that has completely turned around. And now rents are going up quite rapidly uh, helping to drive the overall CPI to, to quite high levels. So it's the, the, the uh, supply side and demand side, as Dennis said, are both been exacerbated by, by the pandemic. I guess one thing that I would, that we don't have good data on, but it seems clearly one of the outcomes of the pandemic that I worry about is again on housing quality. And there's been a, a, a variety of studies, some at the Joint Center, some from the Urban Institute and the Turner Center at Berkeley that have looked at the impact on particularly small landlords and the, the inability of renters to make rent has put stress on particularly um, these affordable unsubsidized housing units and landlords have had to cut back in ways like maintenance in particular, but also some of missed um, uh, payments on their mortgages or property taxes. Um, more of them are considering putting their properties on the market. And so it's creating a lack of investment and an instability among that affordable unsubsidized housing stock, I think that will potentially exacerbate worst case needs. Thanks, Chris. Um, Robin, you're on the ground. Uh, you've been seeing the pandemic uh, on the ground in your properties and, and into the communities that you work in. Could you kind of reflect on uh, Chris's comments and, and share with us some other uh, factors that you see are driving worst case needs currently? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start with your comment that you that I think many of you opened with in terms of where the need for extremely low and low income housing uh, is needed. And, um, you know, here in Los Angeles, the California Housing Partnership Corporation produces a, you know, housing need report locally or statewide and in local regions. So in Los Angeles, we're probably about 65% renters. Uh, we're very much a renter uh, region. And 78% uh, of extremely low income um, renters in Los Angeles are written burden. Uh, and that's compared to about 2% of moderate. 
So I would only imagine that that continues to be the same, the same post pandemic, that just the shortage of av available apartments or places to rent in Los Angeles have, have just been further impacted um, by, by the pandemic. We um, also need to produce or have available about 800,000 units for extremely low and low income renters here in Los Angeles. And right now we have a shortage of a half million uh, units. Um, and again, because we're probably only producing, you know, at best uh, 5,000 units a year in, in the county, that just continues to grow. So post pandemic, uh, we're still just having a shortage uh, of overall units available to us. Um, you know, in our affordable housing portfolio, in terms of uh, of residents who have been impacted by the pandemic from an economic standpoint. We did a survey uh, last year around this time and at least um, you know, 69, 70% of the residents living in our affordable housing units um, had been impacted from an economic standpoint. So I definitely see that as the recession hits and people that are working in retail, hospitality, you know, um, those are the, the jobs that have been impacted and will continue to be impacted. And those are the types of families we're living in our affordable housing. And then um, lastly, uh, in terms of, I think our biggest concern is what will happen uh, after the moratoriums are lifted here in, in Los Angeles, ours will extend a, a significant period of time. But um, I believe the available resources for rent relief in California may meet like 50% of the overall need. Um, so that's going to have a significant impact on extremely low and low income residents um, post pandemic as well. Thanks, Robin. So you already started to move the conversation into policy levers, what to do about this. Um, we, mm -hmm. we know that we've got this need. It's a stubborn need. It's been, it seems to have grown since the um, in, in, in recent years. And um, we know that the pandemic has exacerbated the need, um, but we also know we have a new administration in place and that in Congress, they're actively debating right now about how the federal government can address worst case needs, whether that's through Build Back Better, American Rescue Plan, the budget process. Um, and I, I'm, I'm looking at you um, uh, to see if you could kind of Talk to us a little bit about what you think are the most important proposals out there right now um, that can help address this need. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's something I've been spending and my team has been spending a lot of time on uh, recently and we, we talk about this quite a bit. I wanna start by saying uh, what we hope to see in the long run is a permanent solution uh, around affordable housing, as we work our way towards um, housing, universal housing, uh, universal vouchers, we need to consider those incremental steps. But we do think that universal vouchers, which, which really means that everybody who's eligible for a housing choice voucher would get one, um, is, is ultimately what we wanna be aiming at right now. Uh, ultimately what we want to be aiming at. But right now, uh, we have a number of things in front of us that we really want to take advantage of. And like many of the other speakers have said, for Build Back Better in particular, which is really the, the piece that's under discussion right now to be effective, one, housing has to be included, affordable housing has to be included, and two, it has to address both uh, the supply needs and affordability. A number of folks on the panel have said that today. And uh, for, for many people in the audience, you probably know that the, that the center is particularly focused in three areas, uh, supply, increasing supply through investments in the uh, National Housing Trust Fund, um, making improvements to our current public housing stock. And I think probably most importantly from our point of view is a significant increase in rental assistance through uh, housing choice voucher expansion. And the reason that we're focused on these three areas and how it ties to this report is that they are resources that are highly targeted to the populations that this report show are facing the greatest challenges in getting and maintaining safe and affordable housing. So we really need to focus on those who need help the most 
and that includes uh, people at extremely who are extremely low income um, who have disabilities, seniors. I saw a question just come in through the chat about seniors, working families, and and children. We need to use uh, an equity based targeted universalism approach to ensure that the system works for communities of color and LGBTQ people um, who've been subject to racist and discriminatory practices in the past. And I think we have a real opportunity to do that with this, uh, with this legislation if it includes housing and if it includes a, a package that addresses both supply and affordability. Thanks, Dan. So supply and affordability, um, two big policy levers at the federal level. Dennis, what do you think? You also sit uh, at the BPC and think a lot about federal policy on housing. Uh, what do you think are some of the uh, the big uh, hot, tipic, hot ticket items uh, that you'd like to talk about? Well, yes, I work at the BPC and the B stands for bipartisan. And uh, the good news is there are a lot of ideas, a lot of initiatives on the table in Washington that enjoy bipartisan support that could make a difference, that could help uh, solve the, uh, or at least mitigate the housing affordability challenge. Uh, one of them, of course, is the expansion of the low income housing tax credit, which has been the nation's most uh, successful program to encourage private investment in the uh, preservation and construction of new uh, affordable rental units for lower income People. So expanding the low income housing tax credit, making it an even more effective program is something that enjoys bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, secondly, there's this Neighborhood Homes Improvement Act, which would um, incentivize private investment in the preservate rehab and new construction of homes for first time home buyers in distressed communities who are low income. And this bill estimates are about 500,000 homes could be created over the next 10 years. It enjoys bipartisan support in Congress and it would address this issue, which we haven't talked about in the worst case needs report about the, the crowding out effect, about how the lower income households are often uh, crowded out from accessing uh, units by people in higher income uh, brackets. So if you created uh, for these higher income folks, the opportunity to become first time homeowners, that should provide some more relief for the lower people, lower on the income scale seeking to access the, the rental market. So that's another thing, the Neighborhood Homes Improvement Act is another idea that enjoys bipartisan support. Uh, reinvesting, and talked about public housing, very important. Uh, reinvesting, modernizing, uh, our public housing stock, which is an important source of housing, affordable housing is critical. And Republicans, uh, many Republicans support the, something called the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, which brings the private, private capital into to, to, to help support uh, the public housing stock. Um, one idea on the table is a competitive grant program uh, to encourage community to reform their local zoning uh, and land use laws to enable more the production of more uh, affordable housing. And that idea of regulatory barrier removal, uh, regulatory reform also enjoys uh, Republican support, bipartisan support. So that's the good news. I mean, the BPC 10 years ago had a housing commission that supported an expansion of the uh, voucher program to make sure that all ELI uh, households uh, get access to it. We They supported the creation of a permanent program at the federal level for emergency, one-time emergency uh, assistance for renters who uh, potentially face eviction. So I guess the point I want to make um, is that there are a lot of things in Congress being talked about in Congress on housing, enjoy support from people uh, across uh, on both, both parties across the aisle. Before I go, Ben, I just want to, I may not have time. One thing that struck me in this report is the significant increase in uh, worst case needs among older renters, ages 62 and above. There is a six, 607,000 additional uh, low income, uh, additional worst case needs among uh, older, older renters. And I think this is something we really need to be focused on as America ages, as the population the percentage of the population that is 65 and above grows is, is focusing on the needs of, of uh, older, older renters and whether 
you know, are our are, are homes suitable for them? Suitability might be something we ought to be uh, looking at as well as uh, adequacy. Uh, are they suitable for, for an older population? But, but thank you, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks for highlighting the need for older adults. Um, I see a question from Linda Couch in there on that as well. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about federal policy uh, uh, levers. Uh, Robin, what do you think uh, could be the role of state and local governments and, and actors at play uh, to address worst case housing needs? Well, Ben, I can't um, overemphasize the need to bring federal dollars to uh, the local level, especially uh, in California, where unfortunately we are constrained by uh, the ability to tax here in our state. So uh, by Proposition 13, so having those federal dollars are critical. Um, but I think at the state and local level, it's probably the same theme of uh, levers as Anne and Dennis mentioned. Um, as the state of California, um, I am part of the California Housing Consortium, a statewide organization, and we also collaborate with Housing California. And there's a big, a big push to get statewide, another statewide um, bond on the ballot uh, at a larger amount this, this time, uh, $10 billion. And I think it really is creating resources at a level that's going to be sufficient to address the problem. So we keep passing these smaller bond initiatives, but we need to get to a, a larger level. And so having you know, a bond uh, issuance that is sufficient over an extended period of time is really critical. Uh, in California, we're lucky enough to have a state credit program. So to the extent that our state legislature can look at making that a permanent uh, opportunity to produce um, affordable housing and particularly uh, targeting extremely low income folks, that would be great. The other tool that, of course, um, the state has is uh, land use and zoning. And in California, we've seen a number of bills to streamline uh, the production of affordable housing uh, throughout the state, but one uh, that hasn't quite gotten through the legislature is uh, allowing uh, residential zoning with a priority to affordable housing within commercial areas. And so it's sort of odd that some of our cities throughout California do not uh, allow that. So those are really wonderful opportunities. Um, locally, it's very similar. We have a housing trust fund here in Los Angeles, and um, we need to continue to fund it at an appropriate level um, to deliver housing here in the state. There was also a push this legislative period to create a special housing agency that would actually cover the county of Los Angeles and have both um, bonding and land use authority, again, to further streamline uh, how we produce affordable housing uh, throughout our, our county and, and state level. And within those programs is also how they're prioritizing, whether it's funding or streamlining, uh, ensuring that there's an incentive to actually fund extremely low and low income housing and that becomes a priority. And, um, you know, as Anne mentioned, making sure that there's uh, equity land uh, lands associated with it. Um, and then lastly, zoning, um, you know, we still have so much R R1 zoning where you can only build one residential unit. We really need to think about how to create um, zoning that increases density and an appropriate level to get more housing built, um, to take the pressure off of, of the market. So if you can build, you know, infill 10 unit apartments, um, perhaps that takes a little bit of the pressure throughout the city, that takes a little bit of the pressure to build, you know, 100 unit, 200 unit development. So balancing out the zoning throughout our city. Thanks, Thank Robin. You. So so no shortage of levers at the state and local level either. Um, lots to do on the agenda. Um, there is so many other findings from this report that we could unpack. Um, there's a lot in here and we don't have a lot of time, um, but I did wanna just kind of throw a question out to the floor here. Um, you know, the report un unpacks the unequal incidence of worst case needs by geography. It reports the unequal distribution by race and ethnicity. Uh, talks a little bit about the need by disability status. There's a lot in here. So big, broad question. Uh, what other findings in there uh, do you think that you'd like to raise up uh, and elevate uh, and discuss with your peers here? And this is to anybody, really. Um, I, I'm happy to start and just sure. raise up 
some of the 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 um, data that's presented around race and ethnicity. And you've heard me a couple of times now talk about uh, using an equity-based approach and um, and ensuring that we're targeting these resources that we might be getting um, or the resources that we have in the best way that we can. So, uh, you know, recently I've had the opportunity to work with the Urban Institute. We did some mapping around need for uh, the emergency rental assistance program in particular. And when we released the maps on Twitter, we had a number of folks come back to us and say, the highest need areas in, uh, in the map based on the indices that you were using to determine need, including housing need, race, and COVID impact, overlap quite a bit with those uh, the maps that show historic redlining practices. And in a lot of cases, uh, either they overlap or there, there has been some sort of impact around gentrification. We're gonna be digging into that more over the next six months. But I think you know one of the things that I just wanted to say out loud is that uh, folks who are experiencing uh, the worst case housing needs and who are um, highly impacted, really that those neighborhoods are often reflective of those racist housing practices like redlining and covenants and disinvestment in communities. And again, this goes back to the theme that I was trying to point out at the beginning, which is really these are all cross-cutting, these are cross-cutting issues that need a racial equity lens uh, applied to them so we can have the best impact that we can have. And it's not just about the, the money. It's a lot about the money, but it's not just about the money. It's about how we um, approach the policy. It's about asking people who are closest to the challenge and to the problem, what they want and need and designing policies for those folks. Um, it's about doing things like getting rid of uh, discrimination around source of income. Um, so, so all of these things, I get are tied together and this report sort of nicely points to uh, some of those things that we need to consider as we're thinking about racial justice and, and equity um, in a broader sense. And, and Ben, if I might just, uh, in terms of the geographic variation, I think one of the, the graphics of the, the, the report I really like was the, the chart showing the association between uh, the share of households with assistance and the incidence of worst case needs. And obviously, if you count someone receiving assistance as not having a worst case needs, there's going to be you know, an inverse relationship there. But mm -hmm. and it, and there are strong geographic variations. The Northeast and Midwest in particular tend to have higher levels of assistance. I think one takeaway from that is the, the value of supply side subsidies as gifts that keep on giving. And one of the reasons why the Northeast and the Midwest have higher shares of assisted households is because they played in all of the housing production programs going back to the 1930s. And so we have a stock in New York City and in Boston of public housing that provides a really important foundation for assistance. Um, and so I think as we think about different means of, of, of supplying affordable housing and the fact I think that the Build Back Better agenda includes supply side subsidies is important because it builds an infrastructure that has lasting value. I will add though a caution to that, which is that we can't just assume as the report does and perhaps because it has to, that people in assisted housing don't have worst case needs. And I think there are really significant concerns about the quality of particularly older public housing, but even some of the older project-based housing. And I think we need a more nuanced uh, view of the, the quality of that housing. You know, one of the striking things on a racial side was the fact that African-Americans are actually have lower rates of worst case needs, but that's primarily because they have high rates of assistance. And as we drill into that, they're gonna have higher rates of assistance in public housing. And not all of that public housing is well located, not in areas of opportunity, not in good quality housing. So I think that means we need to also invest in that existing housing in those communities. Uh, just because they're assisted doesn't mean that they are uh, getting the quality of housing that people need and should expect from their, their assisted housing. Thanks, Chris. Um... That I call that chart that you referenced the bubble chart, and it's also my favorite as well in that report. And I try to get that uplifted as much as possible. I love the bubble chart. It's complicated until you like read it and learn about it, talk about it, then it then it like clicks. 
Um, you started to talk a little bit about um, some of the shortcomings, I guess, of how we define worst case housing needs. And this kind of gets us into like the last theme of the conversation, which we only have a few minutes. Um, and that is, uh, what are we going to do in the next two years? We report, we do this report every two years. There's some uh, some ability for small changes or supplemental studies or uh, slight changes to how we look at the data. I wanted to just put that out there as what what are some suggestions that you have for HUD and, and the analysts here on on uh, helping this report uh, evolve over time? Well, I, I would. Hi, Ben. I would say uh, just to uh, kind of work off of Chris's last point about geography, I noticed, you know, as, as I think Ann and Robin have, have mentioned that um, worst case needs decreased in the South, the Midwest, and the Northeast, but increased by nearly 7% in the West. And then you look at the supply numbers, and since the West had the, mo the, the worst availability of affordable rental homes, just 44 per 100 very low income rental households. So I was thinking what, okay, so the worst case needs is the result of a lack of supply. Is that the primary, primary driver as to why the West Coast is, uh, is in the worst situation and why, why we saw worst case needs increase? I, I think maybe a little, Putting, that, putting those points together in the report to provide some sort of explanation. I don't know if you did in the report, I didn't see it, but you know, giving sort of answering the why questions uh, periodically, because um, I, I was wondering why, why, what's going on in the West? You know, I've read reports about rents going through the roof in places like Phoenix and, and Boise and rent burdens going through the roof. But I think answering the why or speculating on the why in places in the report uh, would be helpful. Thanks, Dennis. Any other thoughts? Any other things that we should be um, paying attention to for the next report? Yeah. So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, it's it's overcrowding, which is you know, there's being rent burden, and then there is um, um, sort of um, the quality of housing, but then there's overcrowding. And I mentioned here, in particular in Los Angeles, but I'm sure it's in other places where we have you know, large households, multiple households living in smaller units. Um, and so they're taking what probably equates to multiple extremely low income household rents and maybe getting to very low uh, to rent an apartment, but they're still, they're they're still housing instability or quality, lack of quality that exists there. So, you know, I would be interested to see how that may uh, impact um, the, the numbers in that way. I do wonder also what um, sort of discriminatory eviction policy might have uh, in terms of defining worst case housing needs, because it's also how often people, you know, move or have to move that impacts the quality of their life, but also impacts the quality of their lives. You know, if kids getting education, getting to work, transportation, those other things. So those might be two things that might be helpful <clears throat> data points within this type of report. Thanks, Robin. So, so ben, this is, I, um, I, I, I don't want to take us in the wrong direction. I, I do want to emphasize the questions about housing quality and how important they are and, and how little we understand them at a level that we need to. And this is probably not a, an issue for the next two years, but I think a, a bigger issue for the American Housing Survey is how can we measure the quality of housing in ways that really matter for households? I know Peggy Bailey has spent a lot of her career worrying about or not or thinking about health and housing intersections and issues around air quality, uh, exposure to mold, exposure mm -hmm. to lead, exposure to toxins. Mm -hmm. Things are very difficult to measure in the American Housing Survey, but are so important. Um, we had a question in the chat about the impact of climate change on housing. Whether or not people have access to air conditioning in areas where there's going to be you no know, significant heat, or, or at what cost do they get? Will they have uh, access to air conditioning? To what extent are households uh, more uh, at risk of um, you know severe weather that might damage their units that are insecure that way? There's a whole range of issues around quality that I think we don't measure well, and as a result, we don't act on. Um, and it's a bigger question for the American Housing Survey: How do we do it? But I think it's one that we ought to be thinking about because they're really fundamental to people's well-being in a way that we don't have good measures of today. 
And on that point, Ben, I think it's also important to think about the overlap between quality and uh, and people experiencing homelessness or that meet the McKinney-Vento definition of of experiencing homelessness, because there is some overlap there uh, that I don't think that we have uh, examined very closely. Thanks. You know, we, um, our office, Jennifer's office, also develops our research roadmap uh, for HUD that kind of lays out the priority questions that we'll be investing our research dollars into in the next five years. So maybe we'll, we'll reach out to you all to talk a little bit more about some of these other research questions we should be prioritizing at HUD. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, we don't have a ton of time left over. We're set to end at 2.15. Um, I wanted to just give one person a, a chance to respond to this issue on climate change that you talked about, Chris, um, from the chat. Uh, to what extent do you see climate change influencing worst case housing needs today uh, and then into the future? And how, how do these inter intersect? And then we'll turn it over to Peggy for some closing remarks. That's open to anyone. I already had my turn, so I'll, I'll yield the floor to someone else. Well, obviously, you know, if, if, if communities are going to be affected by ocean, ocean levels rising, uh, they may not, the issue may not be housing affordability, the issue may be housing. <laughs> Do I have a house? Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, this is something we definitely uh, should be looking at and, and pay, paying attention to. Yeah. Well, more discussion on that for sure at another time. Um, so that I just wanted to say thank you so much for, to our panelists for lending us your time, your expertise, uh, your words of wisdom, and, um, and also thank you all to our viewers for, for watching today. I'm going to hand it over to Peggy Bailey to give us some closing remarks. Peggy? Thanks, Ben. Um, and on behalf of Secretary Fudge and the entire HUD family, I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting us again today. And I want to thank all of you for attending today's event. The issues the worst case housing needs report shows and that the presenters highlighted the need for more supply of affordable housing, the need to increase rental assistance, the foundational role housing plays in reversing the negative impacts of racism and discrimination, such as the, the outsized representation of people of color experiencing homelessness, explains why addressing the affordable housing crisis is so important, and that it is also a key component of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. While the affordable housing crisis is multifaceted, it isn't impossible to fix. HUD's programs and other federal assistance works for those who receive it. The problem is that too few people do. And we need to take the variety of tools and resources the presenters talked about today and future resources to scale to meet the need. Housing is foundational for all of us and the pandemic has made that crystal clear. So I hope today's discussion energizes you all and the work that you do every day to not accept the status quo as it relates to housing and the affordability crisis. Thank you all again for attending today's discussion.